Good morning. And welcome to this time of worship. A very special welcome to all of you who are visiting with us. We're glad that you're here. Would you please stand for the responsive call to worship? <clears throat> We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell of all your wonderful deeds. We will be glad and exalt in you. We will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Would you please join me in an opening prayer? God, we come before you this morning to give you thanks and praise for who you are, for all that you've done, and for all that you continue to do. We bless you for salvation in Jesus Christ, for calling us to be your own and for gathering us here this morning to worship you. Accept the praise and worship we bring. For Jesus' sake, amen. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Amen. God has greeted us. Let's take a moment now to greet each other and welcome each other in the name of the Lord. Let's continue our praise to God by singing together our opening song, All Who Hunger Gather Gladly. Be seated. This morning we celebrate the goodness of God in the baptism of Adlai Ray Holstein, and I would like to ask Chris and Ashley to come up and also Ed Haveman, the elder. And also Caden and Jace. Can't forget about you. congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we let us hear the Lord's command concerning the sacrament of holy baptism. After he had risen victorious from the grave, Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to this command, the church baptizes believers and their children. Our gracious God has always desired to hold his people in a covenant embrace. The Lord declares over and over, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Pursuing this deep desire, God called Abraham and Sarah to trust in him and gave a covenant sign to show that they belong to him. In baptism, God now claims us in Christ, marks us as his own people, and seals our membership in God's covenant community, the church. Baptism is the covenant sign that God frees us from the power of sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we're washed clean from sin. God's grace in baptism calls us to give ourselves to him in trust, love, and obedience. From the beginning, God graciously has included our children in his covenant. All God's promises are for them as well as for us. We are to teach them that they've been set apart by baptism as God's own children so that as they grow older, they may respond to him in personal faith and commitment. Chris and Ashley, in presenting your child for baptism, you announce your love for Jesus Christ, your eagerness to participate in the life of Christ's body, the church, and your commitment to live as Christ's disciples in this world. With joy, we celebrate together the gift of God's grace in Christ. Since you, Chris and Ashley, have presented Adley for baptism, we ask you the following questions before God and his people. Do you profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and affirm the promises of God made to you and to your child in his word? Chris and Ashley, what is your answer? Do you promise to instruct this child by word and example with the help of the Christian community, the truth of God's word, and in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ? Do you promise to pray for your child and teach your child to pray? Do you promise to nurture your child within the body of believers as a citizen of Christ's kingdom? Chris and Ashley, what is your answer? Would you please join me in prayer? We thank you, O God, for our baptism into Christ's death and resurrection. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters and you created everything that there is, seen and unseen. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil in the water of the flood, and by your saving ark, you gave a new beginning. In the night of trouble, you led Israel through the sea out of slavery and into the freedom of the promised land. In the water of the Jordan, our Lord was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. In the baptism of Christ's death and resurrection, you have set us free from sin and death and opened up the way to eternal life. May Christ, who sank deep into death and was raised Lord of life, keep us and our little ones in the grip of his hand. May your spirit separate us from sin and mark us with a faith that can stand the light of day and endure the dark of night. To you be all honor and glory, dominion and power, now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to ask you to step this way. Adelaide Ray Holstein, for you, Jesus Christ came into this world for you, he lived and showed God's love. For you, he suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried, at last, it is finished. For you, he triumphed over death and rose in newness of life. For you, he ascended to reign at God's right hand. All this he did for you, Ashley, before you knew anything of it. And so the word of scripture is fulfilled. We love because he first loved us. We're gonna baptize your little sister. Adelaide Ray Holstein, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, uphold Ashley by your Holy Spirit. Give her the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy both now in your presence, both now and forevermore. Amen. Like the congregation to stand, please. The friends in Christ, this child of God is now received into Christ's church. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. 
Do you welcome Adley in love, and do you promise to pray for, encourage, and help nurture her in the faith? Answer by saying, we do, God helping us. You may be seated. God's blessed you with uh, three very precious children, hasn't he? Yeah, all of you are special. God has a special plan and a purpose for each one of your lives, and we are so thankful that she's doing so well, and we pray that God will continue to grant her good health and that Adley, along with Caden and Jace, will grow strong physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, in, in one of the Psalms, it says that children are a gift from the Lord, and God has blessed you with three special gifts, hasn't he? And we pray that God will uh, give you strength and energy and courage and everything you need to teach and instruct these children in the ways of the Lord. And we pray that all three of these will uh, grow up to love and to serve you, and that someday they'll stand here before God's people and say, we love Jesus. What more could we want as parents, right? that our children to grow up to love and serve the Lord. So congratulations, and God bless you, and God bless her in every way. Congratulations. Can I congratulate you too? Here, I'll, I'll rub your head. How's that? Congratulations. And ask Elder Ed Haveman would also like to congratulate you. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord our God, forever faithful to your promise, we thank you for assuring us again that you will forgive us and receive us as children in Christ. Grant wisdom and love to Chris and Ashley and to all of us as we carry out the vows we've just made. We pray that you would guide Adley and all of our little ones throughout their lives. Enable them to respond in faith to the gospel. Fill them with your spirit and make their lives fruitful. Give them strength to endure trials, and when Christ returns, let them celebrate with all the people of God your greatness and goodness forever in the joy of your new creation. Amen. It's a song of response. Let's sing together, O God, Great Father, Lord, and King.
before we go to pr- before we go to prayer this morning, I just want to uh, remind you of the church picnic that is scheduled for this Wednesday. If you haven't signed up, I'm told you can still come, and I hope that you do. Um, if you do come, please wear your mat shirt. If you have one, they're going to be taking a picture. And also, I want to welcome you to return again this evening at 6 p.m. for another opportunity to worship the Lord. Would you please join me in prayer? Now, God, we praise you this morning because you are a God in whom we can put our full and complete trust. For we know that you created the heavens and the earth. We know that you keep all of your promises. We know that you are able to help and provide for us in every way. And we know that you will lead and guide us in every way if we look to you. Lord, we come before you today thanking you for your blessings. We give thanks on this Labor Day weekend for work to do and the ability to do it. Lord Jesus, you were a carpenter's son. You know the joys and challenges of a working person. You know the dignity of labor, for you labored by the sweat of your brow. And through your apostle Paul, you commanded every person to do honest work with their hands so that they might be able to give to those in need. Lord, help us, we pray, to be faithful in our work and grant us the grace to work for you as our master. Lord Jesus, help us to be a source of joy to our earthly employers by giving the best of our service and honest portions of our time. Help us always to be ready and willing to cooperate in carrying out our duties. Give employers a sense of responsibility to you and bless the positions of trust that you have given them. Lord, we pray that you would make our work successful so that we can put our earnings to good use in ways that please you. Keep us in health, give us continued employment. God, when we fall short of what we ought to do or be, forgive us and help us in all that we do to show that we are yours and that you are our Lord and Master. We pray for those who struggle financially, for those who are unemployed, for those who are underemployed, for those who have difficulties making ends meet. Provide for them. We pray, too, Lord, that you'd give wisdom to our leaders as they address economic problems not only, but also address the other challenges that we face as a nation. We pray for our leaders on every level of government. We pray, too, for this world. We know that there are many areas of concern. We pray that you would bring peace to our troubled world. We ask that you would thwart the plans of those who would seek to bring evil. Grant safety to those who serve in our our country and the armed forces. Keep them and their families in your care. We also pray for safety for our police officers and firefighters. Protect them, we pray. We remember those who have special needs. We pray for Duane Vandegreen and Donna Renz as they recover from surgery. We lift up Val Kaiser and ask that her surgery would go well on Tuesday. We pray for Matt DeWild as he continues with therapy. Grant that the therapy would go well. We ask for good results for the tests for Heath Stoker and that the next step in his treatment would begin soon. We also lift up Lisa Wiersma as she continues with a second round of chemo. Lord, for these and any others who are sick, we pray for your healing mercies. We pray for your blessing on the classes meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday. We ask that you would lead and guide. We're grateful, too, for your blessings in all the ways that you provide for us We look at our blessings and we know that you are truly good. We pray for safety on the roads this Labor Day weekend. We thank you for this facility that you have provided us with. And we pray that you would uh, bless the gifts that we bring now for the building fund. And we also pray for the ministry of Bethany Christian Services. Lord, thank you for the important work that they do. We're grateful for this time of worship. We love you. We worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now worship the Lord with our morning offering. The first offering is for the building fund, and the second offering is for Bethany Christian Services.
As we look to hear God's word this morning, I invite you to stand and let's sing together, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Would you please join me in prayer? God, we pray that you would guide us by your word and spirit, that as we look at your word, that you would show us what you want us to know, that you would remind us of your truths, and that you would equip us to better live our lives in this world for you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. This morning, we continue in our series on the miracles of Elisha. And we look today at 2 Kings chapter 6. We see how Elisha, through the power of God, makes an axe head float. We've said in previous weeks that uh, Elisha's miracles show us God's power not only, but also his, uh, God's personal interest and help to those who come to him in need. And we see that again this morning. The second Kings chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 1. The company of the prophet said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried, it was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. God blesses the reading of his word. The story is told of Hudson Taylor, who was the great missionary to China. Taylor was in the process of establishing a hospital. There were a number of patients who were already there, but unfortunately there was a scarcity of food. One day, one of the men who worked at the hospital came into Mr. Taylor's office and said, Mr. Taylor, the last bag of rice has been opened. And Taylor looked him straight in the eyes and said, Well, now, then, help certainly cannot be far away. Hudson Taylor was a great man of faith. He knew that he was doing God's work. He knew that he was dependent upon God, and he believed that God would provide for him everything that was needed. And that's what we see in our story today. We see a God who cares, a God who provides what is needed for people who are doing his work. I want you to notice as we look at the story of the building project that's taking place is that the company of prophets, first of all, were involved in a work of necessity. This was something they had to do. 
They were involved in the Lord's work. The place where they were meeting was too small. In the original language, it says the place was too narrow. The place could not handle all of the students who were coming to the school of the prophets. And so they decided it was time to expand. It was something they knew they needed to do. It's pretty obvious that these men, these company of prophets, were men of vision. When it comes to the work of the Lord and the kingdom of God, there it needs to be vision. And what happens when people have a vision and they see that the work of the Lord needs to be expanded? They don't say this is something that we could do or something we don't have to do. It really doesn't matter either way. No, these people saw a need. They saw it as a necessity. They saw it as something that needed to be done. That's why our denomination continues to send missionaries to various parts of the world. That's why we continue to plant churches in various parts of this country and in Canada because we see that there is a tremendous need. It's a need for expansion. The sons of the prophets were involved in a work of necessity. And secondly, I want you to note that the company of the prophets wanted to do God's will in the matter. They were involved in the Lord's work. They knew that something had to be done, but these men were not men who were wise in their own eyes. They knew that they needed advice. And so what did they do? They went to Elisha and asked permission to do the work that they were planning to do. In other words, they wanted to make sure that they had the blessing of Elisha and the blessing of God. We see that in verse 2, the company of the prophets says to Elisha, let's go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to live. And Elisha said, go. They asked for Elisha's blessing. And in doing so, they were really asking for God's blessing. And certainly, that is a good thing for us to remember as well. It's important to remember, isn't it true, that sometimes we can be incredibly wise and smart in our own eyes? Or sometimes we get so busy doing the work of the Lord that we forget that we need wise counsel of others and that we need to go into our inner closet and close the door and ask God for wisdom and guidance. Isn't it true sometimes that we ask God to bless what we've already decided that we're going to do instead of asking God to show his will to us? Maybe that's one of the reasons that sometimes we fall flat on our faces and things don't turn out the way that we had hoped because we don't always remember that we are totally dependent upon God. And we are more dependent than we oftentimes realize. Maybe we can testify from our own lives that God will give wisdom and direction and will open doors if we ask for his wisdom and guidance and direction. But maybe we can also testify this morning that those times when we didn't ask for God's wisdom, direction, and guidance and we were wise in our own eyes that we found out that God's able to slam the door in our faces. The prophets did a work of necessity. They wanted to do God's will. And thirdly, I want you to note that the company of prophets were willing to work. We're not told how many there were in the company of the prophets, but we are told that these men were going to go get an axe, and they probably got more than one, and they're going to go to the Jordan River. They're going to chop down some trees. They're going to go over there. They're going to build a place to live. And we know that these men are willing to work. And of course, that's an important truth to remember when we are involved in the Lord's work. We can have vision, we can get counsel, we can pray about it, but if we're not willing to work, we're not going to move forward. And we're not only talking here about the programs and the ministry of the church, but it's especially true, listen to me, in the spiritual matters in our personal lives. 
Sometimes we say, I, I, I know I really need and I'd like to have a deeper relationship with God. I'd like to have a more conscious awareness of his presence in my life. I'd like to have more joy, peace, self-control, more wisdom. I'd like to be a better husband, a better father, a better parent, a better worker, a better friend, the kind of person that God would have me to be. And if that's true of us this morning, then we can be assured that it's not going to happen if we don't do anything about it. We have to get into God's Word. We have to pray. We have to study the Bible, and sometimes studying the Bible is not an easy task. Sometimes we need to remember that prayer takes effort, but if we want to become the kind of person that God has us to be, we need to abide in the vine. We need to stay close to God so his life can be lived through us. We've got to go to his word. We need to get down on our knees again and again. Needless to say, if we want to be the kind of people that God would have us to be, it takes work. But notice in this particular situation, the company of prophets were willing to do what needed to be done. They had a vision of what needed to happen. They sought wise counsel. They were willing to become involved, and they were willing to let the Lord use them. But there's something else we find in our story. We find out in verse 2 that the company of the prophets wanted Elisha to go with them. We read that Elisha had given them his blessing. He said, go ahead and do it. Go to this place. Expand the meeting place. But what's so interesting is that one of the men, one of those in the company of prophets is not satisfied. You can almost hear him say, Elisha, we want more than your permission. We want you to come with us. And you can hear the urgency in his voice. Look at verse 3. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? Elisha, if you don't come with us, it's just not going to be the same. We need you. I read that, and I can't help but think of the fact that we need even more than the chief prophet's permission, we also need the chief prophet, our Lord, to go with us in our day-to-day -day lives. Friends, if we don't have the Lord with us and we don't look to the Lord on a regular basis, then we can run into all kinds of problems and not have anybody to help us, and we try doing things in our own strength, in our own wisdom, and our own resources, and we don't even have to think about the fact that some of the experiences that we have from day to day are too common and too ordinary, and sometimes we think we don't even need the help of the Lord. Look for a moment at what these people are going to do. They're going to do something that's very common and ordinary. They're going to go to the shed. They're going to get an axe. They're going to put it over their shoulders. They're going to go down to the river. They're going to chop down some trees. And this man is not satisfied to go alone to do an ordinary task. He wants the prophet to go with him. Friends, think about this. When you go about your business tomorrow, when you go to work, when you're out on the farm, when you go to school, when you're out shopping, when you're on the road, when you're doing dishes, do you feel the need to be conscious of the presence of God in your life? This man wants Elisha to go with them. We see in verse 3 that Elisha says that he will go along. And so they go to the Jordan River, and they begin to work, and they begin to cut down some trees. And that's when it happens. A man takes the axe, slings it over his shoulder. He's ready to hit the wood, but instead, maybe when he hits the wood, the axe head goes flying. The Bible says the iron axe head flew off and fell into the water. And then the man cries out, Oh, my Lord, it was borrowed. 
the man's really upset. We might think, relax, calm down. Don't be so childish. It's just an ax head. What's the big deal? Why go off to your master with such intense frustration? It's just an ax head. Why is the guy so upset? We find the answer in the words that follow. It was borrowed. Friends, this was not just any old axe head. This was a borrowed axe head. That is where the Bible puts the emphasis. The axe head that fell into the water was borrowed. And that would mean he would have to replace it. That would cost money. Money he probably didn't have. And I can imagine his heart sank and he thought to himself, you know, it's like, I don't have money for this. I don't have money hardly for meals. I don't have money for tools. I had to borrow something. What would it take for the man to be able to pay it back? We might say, just go to the hardware store and buy another one, and he would look at us and he would say, with what? I don't have the money. So what is there that we can learn from the borrowed axe head? Why do you suppose God put this story in the Bible? To answer that question, we need to remember that these men are doing the Lord's work. They are doing something for the kingdom of God. And to do something for the kingdom of God, they had to borrow something. They had to use things that did not belong to them. And friends, what a great reminder for us is that we too are called to do things for the kingdom of God and do you know that the tools that we are to use for the kingdom of God are also borrowed they're not our tools everything that we use for the kingdom of God is borrowed it's our time our talent our knowledge our wisdom our strength our resources, even the little things we have in life like an axe head, all of them are given to us from God and we need to remember that. We need to remember that they are all borrowed. You think about this for a moment. We're careful with the things that we borrow, aren't we? For some reason, you had to go tomorrow to your neighbor's house and say, you know what, can I just borrow your car for a little while? I'm stuck. And he said, go ahead. Would you be extra careful with that car because it was borrowed? And friends, if everything that we have is borrowed from God, then we have to be careful with it. For example, the Bible tells us that our time is a gift from God. And so we need to think about how we use our time. Do we fill up our days with activities that are worthwhile? I read a while back that if a person watches three hours of TV a day between ages 5 and 65, that they will have given up seven and a half years of their lives. Is that what we want to do with this time that we have borrowed from God? Do we want to fill up our days with things that matter? Or do we want to just drift through life carelessly, not intentionally, just doing whatever occupies our time? Do we look at the goods and resources that God has given us as being borrowed? Do we remember that we have to be extra careful with things that are borrowed? We look at the people in the world who have not heard the gospel. We look at people in the world who do not have to eat. And then we also look at the fact that God calls us to responsibility concerning people who don't know the gospel and who don't know enough, or don't have enough to eat. It's kind of like I was hungry and you took the borrowed resources that God gave me or us and we either fed the people or we didn't. I was a stranger. I was sick. And you took that borrowed time and either you visited me or you didn't. 
these man, this man from the company of the prophets was so concerned that he had lost something that was borrowed. And finally, I want you to note this morning Elisha's response, which, of course, is the miracle. Elisha says to the man who is so upset and he's so filled with anxiety, he says to the guy, where did it fall? So the man took him over to the Jordan River and he said it went into the river right there. And so Elisha took an axe, he cut off a branch, he threw that branch in that spot in the river. And we read that the iron began to float. Now, lots of people today would try and find a way to explain that because they don't believe in miracles and they, don't, they say that God doesn't do miracles today or God doesn't even exist, and so they try and explain it away. But you think about it. You take an axe head, throw it in the water, and see if you can get it come to the surface. You can be sure that it wouldn't happen. This was a miracle that God performed in order to provide for a person in need. And it's here that we see that God's concerned about the big things not only in life, but he's also concerned about the little things. It's interesting to note, it's important to note that this miracle is tucked between two other miracles. Last week we talked about Naaman who had leprosy and Elisha healed him and having leprosy is like a really big deal. Next week, in, later on in this chapter, we look at another miracle where the enemy of Israel has surrounded a particular city and Elisha blinds the enemy. And so what do we see? We see that we have a God who heals diseases. It's a really big deal. We also has, have a God who is able to conquer enemies. And in our story this morning, we see that God is concerned about little things, like axe handles that are borrowed. And he's able to make them float. Whenever I read this story, the first thing that comes to my mind is when I was, oh, probably in my 20s, I was canoeing with some friends on a river in northern Michigan, and all of a sudden a branch caught my glasses and flipped them in the water. And my friend got out of the boat, or out of the canoe, and it was water and about waist deep, and I was not much help because my glasses were in the water, and he's looking around and feeling around, and I'm praying. I didn't expect that my glasses would float to the surface. I would just be happy if my friend found the glasses, which I didn't think was very likely because the river was moving along. About 10 minutes later, about 10, 15 feet downstream, my friend was walking and he felt something smooth and he bent down and he picked up my glasses. A reminder that God's concerned about all the little things in our lives as well. God was concerned about the need of a man who lost an ax head into the water. David Roper says this about the miracle of Elisha. The simple miracle enshrines a profound truth. God cares about the small stuff of life, lost axe heads, lost coins, lost keys, lost files, lost contact lenses, the little things of life that cause us to fret and stew. He does not always restore what was lost. He has good reasons of his own, but he understands our loss and comforts us in our distress. Friends, here's a reminder that our small worries matter to God. Do you know why our small worries matter to God? It's because we matter to God. The Apostle Peter tells us, cast all your anxiety upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Friends, tomorrow you're going to get up. You're going to face new challenges. Maybe lots of small challenges. You might even face some really big challenges. 
I want to remind you that God is able to do more than you ask or imagine. Rest assured that he is able to take care of you. And that's what we see in our story if we look to him and we trust him. Friends, what God is telling us here this morning is that if we know that everything that we have belongs to God and we're his stewards, and if we desire to do his will, we can be assured that God will give us everything that we need. We can be assured that he will take care of us. God promises to do that over and over again in his word. He promises to take care of his own. Apostle Paul gives a wonderful promise in Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? In other words, if God gave Jesus his son for our salvation, will he not also look after our needs? And that's the place to start, to make sure that we know God as our Savior from sin. And then to look to him on a daily basis for things big and small and ask him to provide and help us for what we need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are concerned about everything that happens in life, the little things as well as the big things. We thank you, God, for the way that you provide for us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to what you've called us to do, that you would help us to use our talents and resources and our time wisely. God, thank you for sending your Son to this earth so that we might have forgiveness and eternal life. May we, out of deep gratitude, use all that we have and all that we are for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's a song of response. Let's stand and let's sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
be seated. Now we're going to take a moment to uh, prepare for the Lord's Supper next Sunday. The preparatory form is found on page 976. It's also on the screen. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion, let us remember that Scripture calls us to examine ourselves before God. We are taught that eating and drinking unworthily brings judgment upon ourselves. Let us therefore ask God for the proper spirit in which to celebrate the sacrament. Almighty God, before whom can be neither secret thought nor hidden deed, grant us your spirit that we may know our hearts, our lives, and our inmost thoughts as you know them. Grant us your grace that we may repent sincerely of all sin, find peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ, and grow in assurance of salvation in him. May the celebration of our Savior's infinite love and his redeeming death bring joy to us and glory to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the atoning power of our Savior's death and for our share in his victory over sin. Open our hearts as we prepare for this celebration, that it may strengthen us in our faith, establish us in our hope, and confirm us in our love. In his name, amen. Brothers and sisters, let us first examine our faith. We all confess the truth of God as taught by Scripture and summarized in the creeds of the church. By this faith, we take to ourselves Christ and all his benefits, so that for us to live is Christ. Lord God, author and finisher of all true believing, Confirm our faith as we prepare for the Holy Sacrament. Let us further examine our hope. All Christian hope rests upon the finished work of Christ as Savior. The Holy Gospel teaches that all of our righteousness is in him alone. God's children rely wholly upon the merits of Christ, find in him their strength and victory, and confidently expect his return in glory. They look forward to celebrating this Holy Supper anew with him in the kingdom. They will surely be received by God at his table. Most merciful Father, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may abound in hope. Let us also examine our love both for God and our neighbors. Remember the great and first commandment to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us consciously determine to live a life of loving service to him through Christ our Lord. Let us also search ourselves to determine whether we love our neighbor as Christ commands. Do we unselfishly live for the welfare of others? Do our lives reflect the godly virtues of obedience, fidelity, integrity, justice, humility, and contentment? Do we seek reconciliation with our neighbors in all cases of offense? Dear Father, daily increase in us the greatest gift of all, our Christian love. If these marks of spiritual life are not evident in us, we may not presume to approach his table. Those, therefore, who live in self-righteousness, who hope in works or virtues of their own, and who do not show love to God and neighbor have no true place at the Lord's Supper. Yet we should not be deterred by any sin lingering within us against our will. As we find faith, hope, and love within us, we ought gladly to obey our Lord's command and come with full expectation to God's open house of mercy. Gracious God, we love and adore you in Christ our Lord. We thank you for reconciling us to yourself in him. We rejoice in being received as your children. Prepare us by your Holy Spirit for the sacrament. Help us to come in the assurance that by it we shall be spiritually revived and strengthened in faith, hope, and love through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand for God's parting blessing? People of God, as you leave this place, go with the Lord's blessing. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. 
Amen.